Hello, and welcome to the Computational Performance Workshop. My name is Ray Loy. I'm the ALCF lead for training and a member of the performance engineering team. I'll be talking in this presentation about how to debug on the ALCF Theta and Cooley systems. So I'll cover four main topics, how to run interactive jobs on Theta, how to deal with the core dump situation when your program fails. Also on Theta, how to deal with the situation of figuring out where your program is if it deadlocks to take a snapshot of its state. And then finally, I'll talk about how to set up to run DDT for a full interactive debugging session on either Theta or Cooley. And the same methods will apply to both DDT and MAP. So the first part is about interactive jobs. So if you've seen the uh, previous talks about how to run, run things on the machine, they've talked about how to uh, put together a job script and submit the script and, and run it and look at the output. And as you can tell in any batch system, that's usually a, a somewhat time-consuming process. And if every time you submit it, the job fails, then you can spend a lot of time in the queue in between tries. So the purpose of the interactive job is to submit a job where you get a, a, a shell prompt, and then you can, within the same job, run repeated executions of your compute node program. So you run it once, you wait once to get through the queue, then you run, maybe it fails immediately, um, you change uh, some input or you recompile it quickly, then you run it again, maybe it fails, you run it again, you run it again. So in, in you, you save time by not going through the queue for every single um, test of your program. So the way you do this, Instead of specifying uh, a script to a job script to submit, you uh, select this dash capital I option here, and then notice that there's no there's no job script, right? So the same options apply: time, number of nodes, your project name, and the queue name. But there's no script name, and you use the capital I. So that will go into the queue. <clears throat> And you won't get a command prompt back yet after you issue that QSUB. Uh, it'll, it'll say that it's, it's waiting to run. And then uh, hopefully if you submitted it to, let's say, one of the faster debug queues, it will run fairly quickly. And then when the job actually runs, the nodes are allocated, but there's no job script to run. So what happens is you just get a prompt from a shell. That shell is not on the login node, just so that you're aware. It's on what's called a mom node on the Theta system, or if you're using Cooley, it will be the first node of the set of nodes that were allocated for your job. That shell <clears throat> prompt that you get is the same kind of shell that your job script would have executed in but you can type things interactively. But it's the same environment that you would have in your job script. So, for example, if you were on Theta, you could type at this point, app run, blah, 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 just like you would in the job script. And if you were on Cooley, same thing, you could do MPI run, whatever. <clears throat> What's not quite obvious is that at this prompt, you could just take your job script that was failing and just run the job script because inside of your job script is your app run command or whatever. So you could just do that. <clears throat> and then uh, look at the output and uh, make some changes and then just run it again. So when you exit this shell, then the job will go away. The job that's like reaching the end of your normal job script, where when you do an exit command from the shell, then 
your job is over and then the nodes will get released and uh, you won't be able to run anymore. <clears throat> well, what happens if you're busy working and you've kind of lost track of time? Maybe you submitted a 30-minute uh, debug job and the 30 minutes have passed. Well, nothing uh, really bad happens, but you just may not notice that you lost access to the compute nodes. Your shell will, will stay running. Unfortunately, there's no easy way for the system to print a message out reminding you that you ran out of time. So um, the first thing you might notice if you're not paying attention is that you issue another app run and it just fails. It'll just immediately say something like uh, couldn't access the resources or something like that. And if you suspect that this is what's going on, um, what you should do is uh, check your job status in your, in your environment of that shell. There is an environment variable called COBOL job ID. And uh, if you say qstat dollar cobalt job ID, it'll it'll substitute in the job ID and do a qstat on it. And if you see output showing something about the job, that means the job is uh, is probably still running. And if you see no no output at all, then the job is gone. So that would explain why. So the reason why the shell isn't killed automatically is because you might have. Um, an editing session going on in there for your for your source file or something like that and we didn't want you to lose your work so just be aware of that and if you your job is over uh, and you lost your nodes you you do kind of need to um, you know exit out of the shell then run a new interactive job uh, if you want to continue working on the problem so another gotcha um, with interactive jobs is that um, X11 forwarding uh, won't just happen by itself. So suppose you plan to run some command that displays back to your laptop using X. Um, so you would naturally you would connect from the laptop to the login node using ssh-y or, or ssh.x. Um, but when you run qsub-i to start the interactive job, uh, when that job starts, QSub itself is then SSHing from the login node to the mom node on Theta or to the head node on Cooley. So there's a second hop in the SSH, and that one won't extend the forwarding uh, unless you tell it to. So the only way you can tell it to do that is to go into your SSH config in the Cooley Theta file system. In other words, your, your home directory is the same on those two machines. So in your SSH config on that file system, not on your laptop, on the login node, go in there and add forward x11 yes and forward x11 trusted yes. Then after that, you only have to do that once, after you do that and you submit your interactive job, um, then the second hop will forward your X connection over to where your interactive um, uh, job shell is, and then you'll be able to display things back. Uh, it isn't, in my experience, uh, a common thing that you need to do, but uh, if you do need to do it, this is the way to do it. <clears throat> okay, so... Um, Maybe you've made some tests with interactive jobs and you can't really figure out what's going on. You run your program and it crashes. Well, when a program on a, on a normal uh, workstation or something like that crashes, you can enable core dumps and then you'll get a binary core file and uh, you can then examine it with GDB or something like that. Um, that kind of thing is difficult to do on a massively parallel machine like Theta because the sheer number of MPI ranks, each one of which would dump uh, potentially a binary core, would flood the file system and lock the whole thing up. And it would, even if it were possible, it would take a long time to write all that data. And then would you really be able to sift through it anyway? So by default, a crashing job on Theta actually doesn't write anything out. Just ends and it tells you there was an error. What you can do is enable 
a Cray feature called ATP, abnormal termination processing. And what that does is when the program uh, aborts or, or however it, it exits badly, it will write out a merged stack backtrace file. Um, and uh, the file name will be ATP merged BT dot DOT. It doesn't, uh, we'll, we'll explain uh, uh, on the next slide or so what, what you can get from that, but just consider it as a, a lightweight parallel core file for the moment. So your program uh, aborts, it writes one of these files, and then you can then view it uh, with a program called StatView. So how do you make that happen? And then we'll show you how to, how to uh, view that and how to interpret it. <clears throat> So uh, you need to link your program with ATP. And uh, the good thing is that uh, by default, the ATP module should be loaded, so you shouldn't have to do anything. But if you have any trouble, check and make sure that that module is loaded. And then both the Cray and Intel compilers link in ATP automatically. So really, you shouldn't have to do anything except when you run that you need to turn on this environment variable called ATP enabled in capitals. And when you, you do that in your job script before you uh, hit the, the app run command, then uh, when, when app run encounters uh, an error and exits, then the uh, backtrace writing will be enabled. Um, in order to illustrate how this all works, uh, let me present this uh, small program that um, the skeleton of a small MPI program uh, that was uh, designed to fail. So here's our main routine here down in the lower right and you can oops, excuse me you can see that um, all it does is that uh, half of the ranks sleep and the other half of them call branch one. Okay, so half of them call branch one. In branch one, <clears throat> half of them sleep and the other half call branch two. And then in branch two, half of them sleep and the others call branch three. And in branch three, um, we end up with uh, rank zero calling abort after a very short sleep. And if there, if there, you ran this on enough processors total, then uh, there might be some that, that slept there too. So <clears throat> basically uh, this program uh, gets uh, different ranks stuck in different places and then rank zero aborts. So when it aborts, right, I ran this program on with eight ranks and ATP enabled and it wrote out the uh, merged backtrace file. And then I, I did a module load stat, and then I ran stat view on that file. And here's what I see. So here's the main routine. It shows this, this call tree of the point of what's going on at the point where the, the backtrace was written. So above main are uh, system routines that got, got you there. But you can see uh, from main that four ranks, numbers four through seven here, are in sleep. So remember, half of them went to sleep. And the other half, rank zero to three, called branch one. Right? In branch one, half of them called sleep, and the other half called branch two. And in branch two, half of them, which is uh, only one, one rank, uh, called sleep. And the other one called branch three and uh, that was rank zero, and so then that called abort. So you can see uh, this nice tree telling you uh, which ranks, right? It groups together all of the ranks that are doing the same thing, because usually what you're looking for uh, when something crashes are the outliers. And <clears throat> so this um, can, uh, can tell you what's going on when your program died. And I, there's, there's no. I, I would actually recommend that you just enable um, ATP all the time when you run because uh, 
there's really uh, there's really no overhead to this unless you actually crash and then if you crash it writes a, a fairly lightweight file so then you'll be able to see what's going on without running it again so um, you're covered now if your program ran and crashed but what happens if you ran your program and it got stuck and you don't know why and then your job just runs out of time and then it gets killed so <clears throat> this probably some kind of deadlock situation uh, and the good news is that if you think your program's deadlocked then you can connect to it uh, using stat which is the um, the same thing that generated the ATP uh, backtrace um, it's just invoked uh, directly instead of by um, this uh, uh, abnormal exit handler so um, what you need to do in the big picture is to get onto the same mom node where your app run is executing and to invoke stat-cl on the process ID of the app run so how do you get that to happen well uh, suppose you run uh, an interactive job and um, <clears throat> uh, one thing you need to do to uh, make life a little easier is to unload the exalt uh, module that's a automatic profiling uh, tool and uh, it, it wraps app run and it makes it a little difficult to find out what the process ID of the app run is normally it, it's uh, uh, very benign and it collects a lot of good data for the system uh, but in this case you'll want to uh, unload exalt and then you run app run <clears throat> and um, uh, in this little example here uh, you can use a dollar exclamation point to tell you what the uh, process ID of the last backgrounded item is so you remember this is an interactive job so you're just typing this this stuff by hand and then uh, you can be looking at the output file and you can wait until the program you think is deadlocked and then when the program is deadlocked uh, you invoke stat pl on the pid where pid here is the pid that was printed out up here okay it's obviously going to be different for every run that you do and you need to um, um, pass into statcl that there's no x11 display for some reason statcl likes to uh, try to connect to your x server even though to do this snapshot it does not need to uh, display anything at all so just uh, pass it a blank that's just quote quote here display equals quote quote space statcl pid and it will make the snapshot right then and then after it, it it'll connect to your app run take the snapshot and then disconnect then you'll get the prompt back and uh, you could actually wait a while and then do another one so every time you do this um, in the stat result subdirectory from where you are it'll write another subdirectory under that called stat test right for the first one you do will be called stat test 0000, 000, 000. Then if you do another one, it'll be called stat test 0001, you know, and so on. So um, <clears throat> this is if you're running interactively and, well, who knows, maybe your job uh, doesn't deadlock until four hours later, so you might not want to run it interactively. Um, so if you submit a job script, um, normal kind of job script, and do the same kind of thing, uh, unload exalt, uh, run app run, uh, in the background here and then print the PID and then do a wait right that's that wait is keeping you from exiting your job script and the job going away um, it's waiting for the app run to finish so if you do that then you'll have some key info you'll have the host name of the mom node that your job is running on and you'll also have the PID so you need those two things to do this so suppose a few hours later uh, you think your job from looking at the output files is stuck and um, <clears throat> so then what you can do is you can from the login node you can SSH to the mom node whose name was output here and then 
on that mom node, uh, you can do a PSU with your own username and, and look at the PIDs, but you, you should have the PID from this output as well. And then you can just run the uh, statcl on that PID uh, manually, and that will that will produce the snapshots just like you did uh, interactively. And then after that, of course, you display them with uh, stat view, just like we did here. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's sort of, uh, I guess you could you could say sort of. Uh, offline debugging in that you're you're um, you're either seeing where your program uh, exited or you're just taking a static uh, snapshot of it at some point uh, what if you need an actual interactive debugger so we at ALCF we support DDT and uh, the map profiling tool which is also part of the forge uh, package and to uh, access this on Theta, uh, you can do a module load forge, and that module should come out of the soft environment modules module files uh, section of the module repository in case you're having any, any issues with uh, it. You can check that that's the one that you're picking up. On Cooley, we're using SoftEnv, and the key for that is plus DDT. And remember that the Cooley's um, soft keys need to go in .soft.cooley. And uh, there are individual keys and modules for uh, particular version numbers, but if you use uh, module load forge or uh, plus DDT, you should get the latest installed version. And if you have any doubts after you do that, just type ddt dash dash version. And right now we're on uh, 19.1.2, which is um, I think just one short of the current or of the very latest version. So we're we're pretty much up to date. As usual, if you're using a debugger, we'd recommend using that not only dash g but also dash o zero so that you don't get uh, optimizations with code movement and things like that that can make it very confusing to step through um, the code when you're uh, single stepping and so forth. Um, okay, so there's some additional online docs, uh, but I will say that this um, presentation is uh, fresh off the press and uh, the screenshots here are the most recent um, examples that there are. So before I, I talk more about setting up DDT, um, I'd like to uh, just mention something that's not directly related, but it will make your life infinitely easier. Uh, every time you SSH to the login node, of course you've noticed that you need to get your crypto card out or your um, crypto app on your phone and generate a, a new token. And um, when you're debugging especially, um, you uh, have to make a lot of uh, different connections uh, frequently. So there's a way to set SSH on your laptop so that after it makes the initial connection to a host, such as the login node, uh, then the next time you do an SSH to the login node, the, 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 the subsequent connection will piggyback on the first one and it won't need a new authentication. So you do have to be a little bit careful if you have things running in the background on your laptop that might be SSHing on their own that they, they can um, inadvertently um, crash the party, but that, that, I don't think that's too common. But just be aware that anything on your laptop that runs SSH and going to the same host will now not need any authentication after you did the first one. So this uh, feature is called Control Master, and uh, it is supported on Linux and on Macs. Um, for the longest time, it was not supported on Windows at all. I found some at least anecdotal evidence on the web that uh, at some level of, of Windows 10, 
it became optional to enable it. So I don't have any hard data on that. Uh, if anybody has experiences, I'm all ears, but uh, all, I, all I can tell is that it might be possible in fairly recent versions of Windows, but definitely not older versions of Windows. So how do you do this? In your laptop's SSH config file, you need to add two lines. One of them is Control Master Auto, and the other one is Control Path. This is where it writes a file that has information about your, your first connection, and that the uh, percent uh, expansions uh, make it unique to the, uh, the host that you're connecting to. So you could just copy those. Um, let me just met, so so what will happen is you'll 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 SSH to theta let's say in uh, one window and uh, start working and then you realize you need a second shell on the theta login so you um, then do another SSH from your laptop uh, to theta that second one won't need an authentication and you could do a third one and a fourth one um, and uh, where this will really come in handy is that the uh, debug client that you run on your laptop will connect to the login node frequently and then if you have uh, already started an SSH session then you won't need to do additional um, uh, crypto authentications for it. Um, let me just mention one thing though that uh, a lot of properties of your SSH connections to that host will devolve from the very first connection that you make. So, for example, if you uh, plan to be using X-forwarding, uh, then the first connection must do X-forwarding. So, for example, SSH-Y. And then uh, you need to also mention it on the, on the subsequent um, SSH. But if you don't use it on the first connection, and you do specify it on the second connection, the second connection will have no way to actually get it happening, and uh, so it just won't work. Right? So you, you, you need to do it on the first one if you're going to do it at all. Okay, back to DDT. Um, there are two ways to run the DDT graphical user interface, and by far the best way is to run it uh, locally on your laptop. So if you have uh, Mac or Windows, what you need to do is go to this path and download and install what's called the remote client. If you have Linux, you can also uh, do this, but what you do is download the full version of Forge, and when you run Forge, it is very happy to act as a remote client when it doesn't have a license. So even though you don't have a license, the license is on our machine, you don't need a license to run the full version of Forge just in the remote client mode. So don't look for a um, remote client version for Linux that doesn't exist. You just get the full version. Um, one thing is that uh, you need to get the remote client that matches the major and minor version. So um, on the previous page here, uh, I mentioned that we're at version 19.1.2, uh, so you need the uh, remote client version for 19.1. Uh, and um, uh, if you don't see it uh, at the link, at the bottom of the page at that link, there's another section called remote client downloads for older versions. So, right, so if it's not the very latest version, which we know it's not, you'll find it uh, under that section that says for older versions. Okay, so if you really don't want to or can't run the remote client on your laptop for some reason, you can run it on our login node and display back by X, but then you have uh, a lot of network lag um, for that connection to display back graphically. The, Remote client uh, doesn't transfer any um, graphical data. It, it's all the direct uh, communication and all the graphical uh, parts of the user interface are all local. So that's the way to go. Uh, so this is a screenshot of the remote client. Uh, if you start it up on 
this is uh, the Mac version. I assume that that looks the same anywhere, and it also looks the same as the uh, the X11 client that you would run um, on the login node. So look and feel is exactly the same. So you've uh, if you've installed it, and uh, you need to do just a little bit to configure it. So what you do is you go over here under the remote launch and select configure. Right? Initially, you won't have any of these host names listed, so you'll need to select configure. And after you select that, this box over here on the right will pop up, and um, you also you, you initially will have nothing here, and you will have to click add. Right, so you're going to add a connection. Then you get this box. So you need to type your username at theta.alcf.anl.gov. Right, this is where it's going to SSH to. And then the remote installation directory. So what you should type there if you want to use the default uh, latest version of DDT that's on the machine is slash soft slash debugger slash DDT. All right. If you want to use a particular version that's not the uh, the latest, then you you would uh, alter that path, and uh, usually um, you can look in that directory and see what particular versions there are. So after you do that, I would suggest clicking Test Remote Launch, and what it's going to do is it's going to SSH there and try to run the back end of the program that's in that install directory. And if everything's okay, it'll say, hey, test succeeded. So that's what you're looking for. And then if that's okay, then you click okay. And then that will show up in your list here. And what you need to do now that you've configured and created that is to select it so that it actually does connect there in a usable way. Right, the next time you use this, it'll still be there. It will remember that connection. So <clears throat> once you select that configuration that you just set up, after a few seconds, you'll see down here in the lower left corner, it will now have a license number information. It got that from the remote end, from Theta. Okay, uh, if you see a message saying something like your support is expired, don't worry about it. It's just informational. Um, the uh, installations on Theta and Cooley, uh, we have uh, the, li the licenses are usable permanently. And uh, if you see a message about the support, uh, don't worry about it. It doesn't mean um, that it isn't a uh, uh, usable license. So um, now that you have your remote client uh, configured and connected, uh, what you do is just let it sit there for a moment. And then the, now it's time to actually start your program running. Uh, and we're going to connect to the debugging um, remote client uh, in, a, in a method that's called reverse connect. So. Um, what you do is you start an interactive job, right? In another in another window, right? This is totally separate from your remote client interface sitting there. Uh, start an interactive job, and then um, where you would normally do an app run with some arguments of your program, instead of just running app run, what you want to do is run DDT dash dash connect app run and then the whole the whole rest of your command that you would run for app run right if you're on Cooley the syntax is different of course you would normally be running MPI run uh, dash f cobalt node file and the, the number of uh, ranks is 12 in this example and in in that case uh, you would change that also to DDT connect uh, but uh, some of the other options get permuted the uh, dash n12 ranks gets pulled out into the beginning and then um, there's a dash mpi args and the node file goes in there. So either way in your interactive job you start 
instead of running your job the normal way, you run it wrapped with DDT dash dash connect. Okay, one thing you can do is um, just go into your job script, your normal job script that, that failed, and go in there and add the DDT connect. And then when you run your interactive job, you can just run, then when you get the prompt, you can just run your job script, right? It's, uh, that, that's an easy way to uh, take care of stuff if you had some other, other setup in there or something like that. And uh, all right, just to mention again that uh, everything that I'm talking about with starting DDT applies to how you would start map. You just use map instead of the map command instead of the DDT command. So when you run, do the DDT connect app run in your job on Theta, for example, uh, as soon as that starts running, this is what you will see in your remote client. Remember, we, we, set, we connected the remote client, we just sort of parked it there, and it was kind of waiting there and listening. And then uh, it's going to pipe up with this pop-up dialog, and it's going to say, uh, hey, a reverse connect request is available. So, yes, you want to accept that. So you click accept. Then uh, you'll see some progress about uh, connecting to the mom node, and um, uh, that'll go away for a second. You'll see it says uh, remote launch via tunnel here. It's still working on it. And then finally, when it's um, connected, the remote client is connected to the DDT instance that you're running in your job, then you'll see the, uh, the run options dialog here, right? So some of these things you have the option of changing before you actually start the run, but usually you would just, you would just click run here now. So then um, it, can, it, it then, uh, DDT on the, the uh, mom node will then actually run the app run and get those processes started and then connect to them uh, with the debug interface. So you'll see progress about that uh, and more progress. And then finally, you'll get the um, uh, view of your source code and it'll be sitting uh, on the first line uh, and ready to go. And uh, you'll be able to uh, just click the uh, green arrow to get going. And uh, in a later talk, uh, Ryan from ARM will uh, tell you more about the um, actual features of debugging. <clears throat> so uh, this concludes uh, my setup instructions for uh, how you can use DDT and MAP, and uh, <clears throat> also uh, running interactive jobs and um, taking uh, stat, stat snapshots and uh, abnormal backtrace uh, dumps. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, any trouble uh, while you're working through exercises, please feel free to uh, contact people who are helping with the hands-on, including myself, um, or to email support at alcf.anl.gov. Okay, thank you very much.